Hello everybody, welcome to What Culture Gaming. I'm Scott. Hopefully you've already seen our first impressions video where I let you guys know what I thought of the Switch based on sort of like an evening with it. But now I've lived with the thing for a good few days in a row. I've put I've lost count of how many hours into Zelda and just play with the system in general and I want to break down all the various features from portability to the resolutions that it can produce to how tactile the controllers are, etc. So Let's get going. So as you've probably seen, there are three main ways to play the Switch. Either you're taking it on the go and you've got the two Joy-Cons slot into the side of the tablet, or you've got it in the dock and you've got it plugged into your TV at home, or you can take the controllers, turn them sideways, and just play any sort of local co-op game or multiplayer game uh, using the controller on its side as opposed to together. As you're probably already aware, thanks to all the adverts that have come out, you can just slot the system into the dock and the feed will jump from the portability of the tablet straight to the console itself. Now, the tablet itself does output a 720p signal, which changes to a 1080p. 80p signal, although some games render differently, like Zelda is in 900p. So, I mean, I guess certain future games are going to have their own custom resolutions, depending on just how graphics intensive they are. Now, this does impact battery life as well, as Zelda can only be played for about two and a half hours on the go, um, whereas something like Shovel Knight or Fast RMX can get up to around about four to five hours. Nintendo have pretty much touted up to between two and six hours in total. So, it's a first step. I mean, at some point they'll probably innovate on this, but don't be thinking that this is a competitor for something like the 3DS in terms of how much you can just game on the go for like a whole afternoon. Now, in terms of how all the power is handled on this, the tablet holds the most charge. Now, you charge this through a USB-C connection, whether it's in the dock or just straight from the wall. The system does come with the cable, so you can just leave it plugged in pretty much every night if you want to. And the Joy-Cons charge from the tablet. So at any given time, everything is drawing power from the tablet. So you want to make sure that has enough charge to last for whatever play session you want to do. Now, the UI is extremely minimal. It's really clean, it's very nice, but it's very stripped back and it's very laid bare in terms of comparisons to the PS4 or the Xbox One. You've just got your basic uh, tiled interface with a handful of icons on the bottom and um, that let you visit things like an album for screenshots you've taken in-game or let you recalibrate how you want the system to recognize the Joy-Cons, whether you're holding them on the side or whether they're combined. Now a poignant negative for long-time Nintendo fans is that the eShop has no music. I know, it sucks. There's just whatever. It's nothing there. Maybe they'll patch it in. Genuinely, there's a fraction of the options available next to like the PS4 or the Xbox One. There's no like HDR toggles or custom button remapping or anything like that. It's just like, hey, what resolution can your TV handle? How are you holding the controller? Go. Personally, I quite like that approach. I like the idea of just getting you into the game, just prioritizing the game first. And uh, although the, you know a lot of people will want to delve into deep system settings to make sure they're getting the best experience, if you just have faith that the system is outputting what you want, it works. Now, one of the weird negatives with this is that the system itself has an internal memory of only 32 gig, or although that's how Nintendo are advertising it. Once you get into the system, it's only 25 gig because the Switch takes up about seven gig for its OS. So downloading something like Zelda will take up about half of that, which immediately makes you think, well, I'm gonna have to invest in external SD cards and that's pretty much the only way forward. I mean, eventually they might make a version of the Switch that comes with a terabyte hard drive or whatever, but for now, you're gonna have to invest PSP style in a stock of SD cards or whatever to keep this thing going. However, the benefit of sticking to cartridges does mean that the games load almost instantly. When you put them in, the system recognizes it, there's no installation times, there's nothing like that. Features that have really bogged down the performance and the process of using a PS4 or an Xbox One, if you buy a game, you take it home, you slot it in, the Switch will boot it up immediately, which for me is a huge positive. So the controllers, now for the most part, if you're playing the system docked, you're gonna have the two Joy-Cons slot into the housing, which means you can play it pretty much like a regular controller. However, the form factor for this thing is quite small and does take a little bit of getting used to, especially if you're coming off the PS4 or the Xbox One and you're used to the more bulky controllers like the DualShock 4 or the Xbox One's pad, especially if you're used to the Xbox Elite controller. A huge plus is that you can turn them on their side and for the most part, whatever game you decide to play will recognize that you've done this and switch the game into multiplayer or two player or whatever. It's as easy as just handing the person next to you one half of a full Joy-Con and letting them just jump into a game. It's really cool. I mean, it's obviously been one of the features that they've sold the system on, but just using it, the tactility of it, the usability of that. It's really, really cool. I mean, it's quite revolutionary when you think about it, especially considering the fact that Sony actually looked into a segmented controller way back in 2011, but they moved away from it eventually. Now, regardless of whether you like the idea or not, the fact that Nintendo actually took that bold step forward and created a segmented controller that instantly allows something like local co-op is quite a cool idea. One of the most obvious negatives here is that just due to the size of the controller, it can be very cramped just to hold, and the new shoulder buttons that emerge on the top, you can bolster them by sliding on the wrist straps, but for the most part, these buttons are recessed 
list and just even accessing them means you're going to inevitably hit a whole bunch of other buttons on the system. Now at this stage you've probably heard about the desync issue which is just that the left Joy-Con occasionally just loses sight of the switch. Sadly the day one patch uh, that came on launch day didn't completely solve this. I've experienced this quite a lot. Even just resting your fingers over where the shoulder buttons would go will cause the switch to occasionally just completely lose sight of the left side Joy-Con so it'll just make characters run off ledges or crash your car or whatever. It sucks and it's the biggest outstanding negative. It's not something that's gonna inherently cripple the console because it can be mitigated by just pointing the controller at the system 24 seven, but you kinda shouldn't need to and that sucks. Just addressing the general pricing structure surrounding the Switch, every major accessory is pretty damn expensive. I mean, you do get enough in the box to get you going, but something like the Pro Controller is retailing for around £60 UK or around $70, which is more than the DualShock 4. It's, it's up there with like the Xbox Elite Controller, but it might be something that you want to pick up if you're going to be playing something like Zelda for an extended amount of time. On top of that, Amiibos are supported. You'll just tap them on the right analog stick. And uh, as far as Zelda's concerned, you can unlock a bunch of costumes that way. So although Nintendo have moved into this whole game first forget about settings, that kind of structure, their microtransactions, if you want to be cynical about it, are pretty much housed in tiny figures. It is an extremely weird console when you think about it and you start breaking down the different uses. Who's it really for? What's it really doing? Has it got any hope in hell of competing with the PS4 or the Xbox One in terms of rendering? Basically, you just have to use it. Thanks to having a very streamlined UI, it does give you something like Zelda right next to a Shovel Knight, right next to a Snipper Clips, etc. Especially all the games that are going to be loading in going forward. You can hop between all them with a very easy to use UI and on the go or whether it's at home, that gives it one hell of a really unique appeal. When we actually got access to this, Switch, Nintendo did send us a letter that uh, exuded the fact that it had a subtle charm, which is a very weird way to phrase advertising your system, but I totally get what they mean. If you've ever had a 3DS and you just have it on you the whole time, you slowly develop like a bond with it, like whether you're just, you know, you have it on the go, you get home, you sit and you play it for a while. I kind of think this is a, a home console designed for that very same ethos. Whether you're jumping between Zelda or Shovel Knight or any other myriad of indies that they're going to be porting onto the system, the fact that you can keep the Switch with you at all times kind of does make it part of your life. And I think that's what they're going for, a console designed around your life rather than designing your life around a console. At this stage, you've probably seen the overwhelming praise for Zelda, and you might be thinking that the Switch is just a Zelda machine, but there's actually a much wider variety of games to play. Number five is 1-2-Switch. Why Nintendo didn't bundle it in with the system, I'll never know, because this thing sells all of the core functionality of the system better than anything else that's out there. You've got the HD rumble in the Joy-Cons, you've got the idea of just motion capturing swords and shooting each other with fake guns. It's very easy to play, it's very drop-in, drop-out. It's definitely geared towards playing as a party or a group of people, but it succeeds in selling the hardware, which is one of the hardest things that Nintendo have got to do when they're in the face of the competition. Number four, the Immaculate Shovel Knight. Now, they actually released two versions of this game, that either the all-packed-in Treasure Trove, which comes with the 2014 version of Shovel Knight and all the additional DLC, or the new campaign Spectre of Torment. Either way, Yacht Club have created one of the best 2D platformers in years, and I recommend just grabbing Shovel Knight, letting its charms wash over you. It's a proper nostalgia trip mixed with the sorts of innovations that, that have come with age, just mixing in particle effects and different styles of levels, different graphical effects, to make a really, really slick 2D platformer. Number three, Snipper Clips. Now this thing is clearly designed for two players. You can play it in four and you can play it solo too, but if you just want to sit on a couch with a friend, embody the idea of two bits of paper, cutting each other into different shapes to solve a whole bunch of puzzles, it enacts on that idea perfectly. It's one of the most charming games on the Switch, and although it wasn't developed by Nintendo, it was merely published by them, it has that Nintendo charm all over it. Number two, Fast RMX. Now if you've been wanting, waiting, praying for another F0, Nintendo have kind of got you covered with Fast RMX. It is an anti-grav style racer. There aren't any power-ups, but it does run at a liquid butter 60 frames per second at all times and supports local co-op. Basically, this is the most natural follow-up to the likes of F-Zero or a Wipeout that you can just drop in local co-op, hand a friend one of the controllers and just jump into a split-screen game. It's awesome. Number one is, of course, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I can't get across how magical and innovative and just sublime this game is. Please check out our full review for all of my thoughts on it. In conclusion, I found the Switch to kind of exceed my expectations over time. I wasn't necessarily completely blown away with it immediately, but it does grow on you. You kind of find yourself just using it all the time, slotting it in and continuing a game on the TV or just grabbing it and taking it with you on the train or whatever. The selection of games right now might be quite sparse, but what is there is still extremely recommendable. Something like Fast RMX is an incredibly good, accomplished local co-op game and that's before you get to the total system seller that is Zelda. Either way, this is a very confident step forward and potentially a huge revolution of the industry if we start going into home console portable hybrids. It might be sold out everywhere. If you've managed to get a hold of a Nintendo Switch, I hope you enjoy it. And if you can pass aside the money to afford one, by all means, get stuck in. I'm Scott from Aculture.com. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you soon.